and you're thinking you're just carrying out something that the doctor is telling you to do. This is not that. This is not for you then. The role of a CRNA and as far as autonomy and independence is very dependent upon which state you practice in. If you have an in-state program that's very strong, you might save a lot of money that way as well. Sandra, so you have more than 12 years of experience as a CRNA in New York and New Jersey, and you also worked as an instructor and educator. Since it's so fresh in our memory, the nurse strike in New York City in January 2023, could you explain what the nurses were striving to get in New York City? To frame it also, this is post-COVID when a lot of nursing and healthcare providers in general, but specifically nurses were very overwhelmed. And there was a lot of emotional trauma there as well, watching a lot of people in New York City die. And I don't blame them. A lot of nurses started leaving. There was a, a retention issue. They were hiring traveler nurses, for example, to fill in these gaps. And they're hiring them at very, very high salary rates to, to mm -hmm. fill this need. While the nurses who were under a union contract were unable to see those benefits like in their salary at that time. But the hope was with the negotiations with the new contract that there would be an increased salary more to reflect that it would be easier to retain nurses because the problem became a staffing issue. As a CRNA, I didn't um, get directly affected by that, but I could see that it was really uh, taking a toll on the, all the nurses across all the different departments. While the fight was for patient safety ultimately and the patient ratios, the salary definitely has, some people would argue indirect, but I think it has a direct correlation to that because you're not going to retain nurses if you're not paying them adequately. So I am a travel nurse. And while I was working in New York City in the emergency room at Sinai in 2020, I saw that travel nurses were filling the gap, as you were saying, but there was also the sentiment among full-time nurses that why don't we get the same amount of money that travelers are getting? Like, why can't we compensate it for the amount of work that we we're doing? So I think that was also reflected in the strike. And they tentatively came to a conclusion that they're going to raise 19% of nursing salary in certain departments and hire more nurses in emergency room in Montefiore. Um, what do you think about that tentative agreement? It's 19% over three years as well. It's not just a one year. So that's that's what it is. They want to retain you for the three years yeah. to see that. And, and retention is the big problem here. Well, most people were reluctant to accept that tentative agreement would be the correct word. I don't think everyone was super happy about it, but I think it just got to that point where they were willing to move forward. I think for CRNAs, it's a little different. The market value for CRNAs right now is different than what the uh, bedside staff RNs are seeing. Mm -hmm. So I think most of the CRNAs were also pretty disappointed in the uh, tentative agreement. It's oftentimes where we get a special clause in certain contracts and stuff mm -hmm. because we are such a sub specific subspecialty. Right. I would say we're, we're reluctantly accepting the tentative agreement. It's interesting to hear that from your perspective who is practicing in New York City because I got the news on media and we just see the words, right? And we see the pictures and we really don't know what is happening actually in the field. So thank you for sharing. I mean, I think like nobody wants to strike in the sense of nobody wants to deal with the stress of that and leave the patients hanging. I think everyone wants to get paid their worth as well. So I think yeah. because this is a union hospital, union reps were sort of saying that this is the best it's going to get. Even though people were disappointed, if the union reps are saying that, then you have this feeling that they're not going to really push for more on your behalf. There was a lot of interest in Korean nurses in Korea. Like what's going on in New York? Like what are they doing in New York? Why did you choose to become a nurse anesthetist in the first place? The funny thing is when most people ask you about becoming a CRNA, they always want to know how did you even find out about it? Because mm. we're sort of like the joke is like we're nurses best kept secret, nursing's best kept secret because nobody <laughs> knows about the subspecialty until they start working or they meet other CRNAs. I was lucky because I went to an undergrad nursing school, University of Buffalo, where they had a CRNA program. So while I was doing research for undergrad nursing, I found out about this like nurse anesthetist program that they had. And I was like doing all this much research as I could online to find out like what this was. And it really piqued my interest. And then when I got there, I got to shadow like a CRNA student, I had a very early mindset that I was going to be a CRNA. I was very interested in how uh, autonomous they were. And so I found out all the requirements for it. And then I went right to an ICU when I graduated as a new grad. So you mentioned that you started working in ICU knowing that you want to go into the field. How can a nurse become a CRNA? 
it is a requirement to have at least one year of critical care experience. Critical care experience means ICUs, not all ERs, it depends on the ERs, uh, not all recovery rooms, it depends on if you're a recovery room that recovers hearts, for example. So they really want to look at ICUs and the more acute, the better. So if you're working at a smaller community hospital and you're not really seeing like the sickest ICU patients, you are getting valuable, obviously, skill and um, experience, but it is not going to keep you competitive. Usually CRNA programs are pretty competitive. And even though the ICU year experience is required, there's a couple of caveats to it, I think, that are unsaid. I think it depends on what kind of ICU you're in, how many years you're there. So even though one year is minimal, if you have a couple of years experience, obviously the thinking would be that you would have stronger experience than someone who's there for the minimum of the one year. Do you have any tips or tricks of getting accepted to CRNA school? When I graduated CRNA school, I used to help out with some of the interviews and I would sit in on part of the interview process. First and foremost, you should have a very competitive undergraduate GPA. If you don't, if you have, especially if it's like core classes that have to do with the critical sciences and critical nursing classes, you should try to retake a couple of graduate level courses and ace them. One of the things you can show and prove is that, hey, I'm willing to do the work. I took the initiative. I took a graduate level course that is going to be required of the CRNA program. And I'm showing you that maybe something in my emotional maturity back then I couldn't do that, but now I'm here, I'm present, I can do it. I can get an A in this like difficult class, pharmacology class or a physiology class or something like that. Most programs are requiring their critical care RN certification. So that's really important. Some programs require GREs and some don't. Um, you'd have to look up right. your individual school. Some people just take it just so that if they're applying to a bunch of different programs, they just have it available. I started in 2008. That was not required of me and my GPA was higher enough. So it also depends. So if your GPA, again, is not strong, then you might consider taking the GREs just to show people that you're capable of graduate level work. Again, like I was saying, the ICUs, the, the more acute, the better. Usually there's a preferential experience like related to anesthesia for surgical ICUs over medical ICUs, for example, uh, neuro ICUs cardiac ICUs, burn ICUs. We're talking about places where you're seeing like the sickest of the sick people in your region and you're learning how to manage them. You're using the newest information that's available to manage these patients. We've had people who've applied that work in a community ICU or a CCU that's not very acute. Not that that isn't valuable, but in order to get the kind of care experience we need, they'll transfer from that like CCU or community hospital to a you know, sister affiliate, that's the bigger main institution, or they'll go to the surgical ICU in order to gain the type of acute care experience you would need in anesthesia. When you go to these ICUs, it's reflecting an understanding of what the role is, is of expected of you. You are going to be a better, stronger CRNA if you really know how to handle all these acute situations, because we're the ones, anesthesia people in general are called for emergency situations, airway situations. Being a CRNA is a reflection of that. And if you can handle yourself in an ICU that's very acute, I think that correlates very much with the type of mindset you need in order to become a good CRNA. What about in the emergency room setting? What kind of emergency are they expected to work in? Usually when you're a CRNA, you are considered part of the anesthesia team. For example, I have worked for private anesthesia groups where the group pays me, not the hospital. My current job right now, I work with the Department of Anesthesia, but I get paid by the Department of Nursing. But either way, I'm considered like an anesthesia provider. So everything anesthesiologists do our skills that as CRNAs, you're going to be expected to learn as well and to be competent in as well, especially emergency airway management. I know the wording has changed in a lot of institutions, but now they don't call it like code blue anymore. They call it like airway code or an anesthesia stat. And there's always someone in anesthesia that's carrying that code pager. And it might be a CRNA, depending on what institution you work at. And when that code pager goes off, you're expected to show up and you're there to manage the airway during a code, for example. Or you may be calling to see a patient in the ED that's going to get transferred quickly to the OR. So you need to secure the airway and help hemodynamically stabilize this patient before they come to the operating room. Anytime there's an airway emergency in-house, anesthesia people are called because we are the ones that manage airways by intubation, mass ventilation, all that. For those who are not familiar with this career, what does your day look like? I will get my assignment the night before for whatever site I'm at for anesthesia. Most people assume the operating room, which is, yes, generally where we are. We're doing elective surgical cases usually. We can also be in sites that are called uh, NORA or non-operating room sites. So that might mean that I'm in MRI one day or interventional radiology 
or something like that. Anywhere where there might be just a quick procedure for a patient where they need an uh, anesthesia person present, not only to provide the sedation or the anesthesia to get through that procedure comfortably, but to also maybe keep them safe through that procedure. For example, my typical day would be in the operating room. Most OR start at 7.30 a.m., so I'm there by 7 a.m. at the latest, and I will go first set up my operating room, which is something that you learn in anesthesia school. Preparation in anesthesia is like a big theme with us, vigilance and preparation. So we go to the operating room, you're doing an anesthesia machine check, you're getting your drugs ready. Based on your assignment from the night before, you if you don't have familiarity with the surgery type, you would have hopefully read up on it the night before. If I can, I would try to look up their medical history because there's always implications on how um, I'm going to do this anesthesia plan based on any comorbidities this patient may or may not have. So then after I set up the anesthesia machine and make sure my drugs are all set up and ready to go and my airway equipment is ready, I'll go to the ambulatory area and I will do what's an anesthesia pre-op of the patient. We do our own interview. We do our own pre-op assessment of um, their history, their airway, any other details that we need to go over. We explain the anesthesia management plan with them. We might discuss with the surgeon some of the things that they may need. After that, usually depending on your institution, we either anesthesia puts the IV in or sometimes the surgery nurses put them in. We get the patient back to the operating room. They lay on the bed. We start giving them some pre-sedation medication, depending on what kind of case you're doing. I'm, I'm assuming this is general anesthesia I'm describing. I would put some marks on oxygen, depending on what the situation is, induce them, possibly put an ET tube in, put an art line in, maybe a second IV. It depends on the surgery, depends on the patient, which are all things you would learn in your training. You get them through the surgery as safely as possible. And then at the end of the procedure, let's say it's a general anesthesia case, you would wake them up, safely extubate them, bring them to recovery room, endorse the care over to the recovery room at that point. And then you start the whole thing all over again. And the entire time of anesthesia, you're trying to keep the patient as safe as possible and as comfortable as possible. Your work is basically the same as an anesthesiologist. And it can be a very hard concept to grasp for Korean nurses because we don't have the same nurses that have the education and the scope of work that we have in the U.S., are you able to practice with your licensure after your um, education independently in New York State? Okay, so that's the big complicated question with CRNAs. I wish I had known going into it. It's very politically charged. There are times where I have to even watch what I'm saying right now because I don't want to incur the wrath of like certain groups. The role of a CRNA and as far as autonomy and independence is very dependent upon which state you practice in. New York State is actually one of the strictest states for CRNAs. And one of the main obvious reasons why is because they will not recognize CRNAs as advanced practice nurses. And we are one of the only few states that does not, I believe the only other state was Pennsylvania. And I think even now they're, they are APRN. So I think New York might be the only state still. I graduated from CRNA school in the state of New Jersey. So in order to study in New Jersey, I was an RN in New York City. I got my New Jersey RN so that I could do clinical studies in New Jersey because you're working under your RN license. And being a CRNA is actually just a certification and graduating with an accreditation from a program. So when I graduated from my program in New Jersey, I was actually able to get my advanced practice RN because they had just converted CRNAs to advanced practice in the year I graduated, which is 2010. So I was actually able to graduate from CRNA school in New Jersey and have an R- I have an RN license there, an APRN license there, and I got a DEA number through the state of New Jersey. So I was the equivalent of like a nurse practitioner in the state of New Jersey. However, working in New York, I do not have an APRN. I I work under my RN license. Every state also has a group of professional CRNAs that get together just like any other nursing institution. The New York State Group Association of CRNAs basically put on the table, we were trying to lobby for APRN title protection. And unfortunately it is a political issue. You do have to get the law to get passed. And then at the time, the ASA, the American Society of Anesthesiologists, fought it and won. And so CRNAs were not able to get title protection as APRN status. And there was kind of a palpable morale drop with CRNAs in the state of New York because a lot of the people who were going to fight against it were our own colleagues that we worked with on a day-to-day basis. So anesthesiologists, the chairs of our departments were up there actively lobbying against us getting our APRN. 
And it was difficult to say the least for many of us emotionally, I think, and professionally, because we know how valuable we are to anesthesia departments and hospitals. And we know that they tell us that they value us on a day-to-day -day basis. But when it became on a larger scale, it was sort of about limiting our power and our ability and our authority in the state of New York. So that's been kind of a, a bummer. During COVID, <clears throat> the governor, they were executing orders that were saying that CRNAs could practice in a non-supervised, non-medically directed manner because of COVID. There's a push to keep that wording the same, that once they implemented it, they were like, great, you've already started it. Let's keep that vocabulary going because we're the only state that's not at that point anyway. It is very complicated. The wording is very like legal jargon. So there's wording of supervision and medically directed. So for the facility that I work at, for example, most CRNAs work at medically directed hospitals versus supervised. So the legal jargon is different. And the reason why the jargon is different, it has to do with the reimbursement that hospitals can put in for. Many, many years ago, prior to a lot of the legislation that there is in place right now, there was no rules over how many CRNAs anesthesiologists could supervise at any given time. Like in the 80s, when anesthesia was making a lot of money, an anesthesiologist could supervise like 10 ORs and have a CRNA in each, each OR and bill for supervision. And then eventually Medicare and Medicaid, which obviously once Medicare gets a whiff of like what's going on in cost saving issues, they intervene and then other insurance companies follow suit, right? And there was this like question of why are the anesthesiologists making so much money when the CRNAs are in the room? So then Medicare was sort of trying to make it difficult for them. They're like, okay, so then in order to get this type of rate of reimbursement, you have to be there for all these specific parts of the induction, the emergence and all this, and we'll reimburse you at that rate, but you can only cover four CRNAs at a time then. Hmm. So they became this new law in effect, basically where one anesthesiologist covers up to four CRNAs at a time. And that's current in the state of New York. And that's current at, at all the hospitals in New York. Like the more rural you go, the more independent CRNAs are. And sometimes they run their own facilities and there's laws to support that. But in the state of New York, we have to get covered four to one for medical direction. You'll hear some propaganda from certain groups saying that it has to do with safety, that CRNAs need to be supervised very closely for patient safety reasons. Historically, that's untrue. CRNAs have practiced just as safely as anesthesiologists. There's a lot of studies. So this is what I mean about the, po the politics of it now. So now you'll start to have people using this type of information to sort of push against. And I think there's this fear that anesthesiologists sometimes worry that like CRNAs want to take over their job. And that's not it at all. A lot of us are perfectly happy working collaboratively with anesthesiologists, but there are times when getting the recognition and autonomy that we deserve on paper, because we're already getting it clinically usually, is a political battle. Thank you for sharing this because it, it, it is a difficult topic to discuss because it can get defensive to some groups. The CRNAs or APRNs or PAs practicing in doing a lot of work for patients, for patient outcome, whether it's in Korea or here, I'm not saying like generally, but some groups, wherever you are, they're going to be saying like, why are you intruding my scope of work? But that's not what we're trying to do. One of the reasons why surgeries can happen at the rate that they do nowadays is because anesthesia has been made safer over the years. And back in the day when anesthesia was first invented, doctors, physicians were so interested in the actual surgery that nurses were actually providing the anesthesia first. The medical people decided that anesthesia was a medical profession. It's a very American thing being a CRNA because it was started here. CRNA has been practicing in this country since the invention of anesthesia, basically. I'm sure I would hear other arguments about how that's not correct. And obviously since the days of like ether drop anesthesia, anesthesia is one of the most advanced medical specialties or healthcare providing specialties you can go into. But I will say on a day-to-day -day basis, CRNAs are often requested by anesthesiologists themselves to provide the anesthesia for their family members and themselves. So if we were so unsafe or if we were so incapable, I don't think that that would be the case. But that's on an unofficial level. And then on a political level, they'll still just try to keep us not getting our independent license. I know it's very confusing. It's one of those things where it's like, unless you're in it and you hear this discussion all the time, it's very hard to wrap your brain around. But it is one of the most autonomous nursing professions. So this is where I also want to express that if you're someone who is uncomfortable with the idea of not being told something by a physician to what to do. And you're thinking you're just carrying out something that the doctor is telling you to do. This is not that. This is not for you then. 
this mm. is something where you are working collaboratively with a physician and you are often running the show. You are often in charge of that patient, in charge of that room. If anything is going down, you're responsible for it. You're also someone who's trying to do excellent care and take excellent care of people and get them through procedures safely. The level of autonomy is very surprising for a lot of nurses as well. I think circulator nurses that see us in action a lot in operating rooms and stuff are a little less surprised because they see us firsthand, but they'll always come up to us and say, oh my gosh, in nursing school, I had no idea that you know nurses could give anesthesia and that you guys are so independent and you're so capable and so competent to the point where surgeons are requesting you guys over you know other providers. And it's like, yeah, and that's one of the reasons why it can be very stressful and very difficult on a political, emotional level as well, because there's a lot to prove sometimes with people about our profession. Going off of autonomy and independence, who do you think makes a successful CRNA? That's also a very good question because I was also the clinical coordinator and I would work with CRNAs in training in the clinical setting often. Obviously a great work ethic. You have to be very studious. You have to be proactive. You know, you can't be someone who just like sits around waiting to be directed often. You have to like take the initiative a lot. And a lot of that comes with like, I think a certain level of emotional maturity. I think for me, I was 22 when I graduated undergraduate nursing school and I worked in an ICU and I waited like five years before I started CRNA school. And I think that was really beneficial for me, even though I could have gone sooner because there was an aspect of emotional maturity that I needed to get to um, in order to present myself more seriously, to have people take me more seriously sometimes. So sometimes I see young men and women coming in who have like very little experience and you just want to sort of foster that growth there. But I will say that in a lot of ways, I mean, this isn't a comparison, but like, you know, when you get a medical school, uh, an anesthesia resident who never really worked, went straight from medical school to residency, and they didn't have that real life experience as an RN. Sometimes you can see the difference between that and a CRNA trainee because they've had that year of critical care experience. So they've worked for a year. And so there's sort of that professional growth there and emotional maturity sometimes that you see versus people who go straight into an advanced practice without having worked at all sometimes. Not always, obviously. So I would say being very good work at work ethic, studious, clinical skills, very emotionally mature, professional. These are very important attributes. The emotional maturity. I agree with you that it's very important in any nursing that you go into too, though. Like, obviously, we all start as new newbie nurse, but right. you grow as a person and as a nurse as you gain years of experience. And even in like NP schools, there are people who go with straight through like FNP. And I was one of them and I did not do well. <laughs> that we need to have some that room or time to grow as a person and as a nurse. And that's my personal experience. Obviously, I see exceptions to the rule uh, often. It has a lot to do with your like, life story. I did not have a lot of support getting through nursing school, both financially and emotionally and a lot of guidance. And when I look at my first year as an ICU nurse, when I look back at it to my third and fifth year, I was very overwhelmed. I was definitely like, what is happening right now? And even at the end of that first year, I learned so much, but by, there's no comparison from the way I was at the end of that first year to the end of that third year to the end of the fifth year of not only the growth I had as a nurse, but the growth I had as like a prof- person and a professional person and learning how to just speak uh, and be respected with a group of physicians, for example, like speaking up for your patient and advocating for them, right? So these are things you have to also learn how to do carry yourself in an operating room. You have to learn how to communicate professionally with the other members of your team, the circulating nurse, the surgeon, and your collaborating anesthesiologist. There are times where you will butt heads and personalities will become a problem. And you have to learn how to sort of navigate that in order to also be successful. Because a lot of the challenges that I see with people in training is that difficult in growth sometimes, that maturity of taking full accountability for things. I think the personality also factors into it, right? How you communicate in, as you said, the landscape of operating room or like PACU, you you can have situations that you have to argue or speak for yourself. um, And that's a big part of being a nurse anesthetist. Yeah, because whatever you think that you're doing to advocate or speak up for, At the bedside level, you'll have to amplify that as a CRNA. Surgeons also want what's best for their patient, but the way they want to go about it completely contradicts with the way anesthesia is trying to keep this patient safe sometimes. So sometimes there are conflicts and I have also found myself in that, you know, and you do get better at it and you do navigate things. 
And the culture of being in the operating room and the culture of being an anesthesia person is a learning curve in itself. Like a lot of CRNA people never really worked in an operating room. You, you were an ICU nurse. So just the flow of the way the OR even works sometimes is like a huge learning curve right there. And that can be difficult for people, but right. most people learn very quickly and meet the challenge. But sometimes I think people are surprised at how much is expected of them very early on. CRNAs are in the field of nursing, the highest paid occupation. So when I was researching the salary.com was saying in New York City, the median salary of CRNA is $240,000 a year. But based on what we talked about, the autonomy and the scope of work responsibilities and your work-life balance, what do you think about that perception? First of all, what, if that's median salary, I am definitely a little underpaid there and I need to uh, <laughs> assess what I'm doing here. And I would say that median value is also not 100% accurate, only in the sense that a lot of that is based on experience and shift right. differentials and all that kind of stuff. So a lot of the base salaries, if you're a new grad, will be less than that. It would probably be closer to the $200,000 area, up or down 10-ish to 15,000, maybe around there. So I would say most new grads probably start around 200K in New York City. The more experienced you are, you are earning closer to that 240. I do believe that we have always been the highest paid, but remember when you go to CRNA school, you are not allowed to work at all. You go full-time. There's no such thing as part-time study. Most of us have significant loans when we come out and now they're making most CRNA programs DNP programs. So they are extending the length of them by a few, at least another semester usually. I think it's reflective of the education level and the fact that you have to sacrifice a few years of income making. I also think that we are in one of the riskiest to your own license practices. Hmm. We take on a lot of responsibility. We have to have malpractice insurance. A lot of us carry our own malpractice insurance. I do believe that it makes sense for CRDs to get paid that much because of the level of education, the level of responsibility and on all that included. And there are lucrative ways that CRDs can make more money. There's per diem jobs and a lot of CRDs are very good at being like business savvy. A lot of us have separate 1099 gigs in addition to our full-time gigs to make a little extra money. I appreciate that you're transparent about and reality of CRNAs. You have to go to school for three years full-time. Like you can work, be working like MP programs or other master's program in nursing. And you decided to go back for your DNP after getting your MSN in anesthesia. Why did you do that? I don't know. No, I'm just <laughs> I was doing the same thing. You know, honestly, and it was hard because I had to finish it while COVID was happening. So uh -huh. I was doing it as a distance learner. I know that most programs are requiring the DNP now. And the goal is for all CRNAs to have a DNP, just to elevate our practice and our profession. So I wanted all opportunities to be equally available to me as anyone else who's graduating currently, even though I got grandfathered in and didn't have to do my DNP. And most jobs, if you are hired in a department of nursing like I am currently, you will fall under that thing where they do tuition reimbursement. So for a DNP part, I was able to go part-time online and I was working full-time. So I got reimbursed through my job. Most jobs will help you pay the tuition, but you're usually responsible for the taxes, which can be a lot when you consider how much tuition is. And I didn't know if I wanted to teach again one day. So I think that was something that I, I wanted to keep under my belt. When you started your nursing career, if there is anything that you would do again or start, why would it be in terms of personal finance? The financial strain is a legitimate concern when you go into CRNA school and um, everyone's unique situation is different. Like we had people who were married and were dependent on their spouses. Yeah. I had paid for undergrad completely myself and I had loans actually still. So I had to defer those in order to go to CRNA school. I and mean, I did everything independently. Some people do save up pretty well, but most people often take out loans. So when I think about it now, I, you know, the funny thing is I had gone to undergrad at University of Buffalo and then I got accepted to their anesthesia program. And because of personal things that were going on, I pushed it off and I ended up deciding to stay local and I went to school in New Jersey. So I ended up paying out of state tuition. And while I do think that my program was great and I preferred it, that's something that people should consider. If you have an in-state program that's very strong, you might save a lot of money that way as well. So if I had gone to Buffalo, if I had relocated back to Buffalo and gone to CRNA school there, I possibly could have saved some money. The programs were set up differently back then. I don't know how different they are now, but there are some programs that were called like front-loaded where you do most of your didactic work in the first few years, and then you do pure clinical at the tail end of it. And then I wanted to go to a program which was much more integrated. So when I went to U Rutgers, which was UMD&J when I went, it was much more integrated very early on, which I preferred. 
So that was a personal uh, preference for me as well. As far as finances, be prepared to take out loans if you have to, but you will make enough money to pay it off, especially obviously the less loans you take out, the more quickly you'll be able to pay it off. If you can save up money in advance, if you know that you can meet up with a classmate and get a roommate, that's something I wish I had done possibly. Most CRNA programs, you are jumping around to different clinical sites. So you may need a car. And if you're living in New York City, it's very expensive to have a car, but it may not be such a big deal to have a car in Buffalo, for example. Is there anything that you would look for when choosing a CRNA school? I would definitely pick one that has a DMP track right now, just because that's going to be the expectation. And you don't want to be like me that had to like go back to get my DNP when you can just sort of knock it all out. Then there's an argument of DNP versus DNAP. So the doctorate of nursing of anesthesia practice and the doctorate of nursing practice with a specialty in anesthesia. Again, some people might argue that the DNAP is too specialized and you'll have a harder time getting more generalized you know, for example, teaching job that isn't anesthesia specific. I haven't really seen a huge difference for people who are, have those types of ambitions um, with a DNP or DNAP. I would choose a program that seems organized. Just from the interview process alone, I had a feeling on one program versus another program. My interview at Rutgers was very nice. It was like a group, a whole group of people that came in and sat down. They showed you this whole PowerPoint. They had like snacks and they had students there so you can answer questions. And one by one, you went into a room and there was a panel of people that you interviewed with. Uh, University of Buffalo, very similar. You met with the different uh, program people individually. And I would say that if you are applying to CRNA school and you do get an interview, what you can anticipate is a very rigorous interview process. It is not easy. It's very stressful. And they will ask you a lot of questions in front of a lot of people. What kind of question do they ask you? What they'll do is they'll look at your resume and say, oh, okay, so you have uh, experience in a neuro ICU. Okay, well, we're not going to ask you neuro ICU questions, actually, because we were doing <laughs> it. We're going to ask you a lot of cardiac questions. Like, what do you know about, you know, LVATs? They'll get very, very deep. And I always tell people- oh, wow. Whatever you say that comes out of your mouth, you better be prepared to go all the way down with that. So if you're the one that brings up an ABG, they're going to be like, great, let's talk about ABGs. What they want to know is how well do you know your physiology and pharmacology? So if you okay. come to an interview and they're like, what kind of drips do you use in your ICU? And first of all, if you say neosinephrine instead of phenylephrine, you're going to, you know, it's like, no, 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 you have to say phenylephrine. You need to know not only like, how does it work? You need to know what receptors does it work on? What kind of rebound would you expect to see? What else do you use? What's the dose you use for that? EKGs, rhythm analysis, anything that's on your CCRN, ACLS, you're expected to know very well. Yeah, I've only heard that they're rigorous, but I didn't know the details. So thank you for yeah. letting us know. <laughs> I, I always joke that, oh my gosh, if I tried to get into CRNA school now, I don't know if I'd get in because I feel like this <laughs> got harder and harder. Sandra, if the audience wants to connect with you online, how can they do so? Email me or they, I'm on Instagram as well. You can always slide into my DMs. <laughs> um, Sandra.choy.crna at gmail.com is probably the easiest way to get to me. And on Instagram, I'm S-A-N-J-R-A underscore Choi, C-H-O-I.